Good morning. The Lord be with you. It is good to welcome you into the house of the Lord this morning, and I want to say thank you to each of you for helping keep all of us safe as we gather today and as we go back out to our families and to our neighborhoods. Uh, masking, keeping distance between households is small. It's a small thing to do, but it is significant. And so I give thanks for that. Uh, when we get to our hymns today, um, I'm just going to ask you to try not to sing beyond your mask. Sing, but maybe like a hum, a quiet singing, um, and let your heart rise higher than your volume. Um, announcement-y things. We've got a couple of lasts coming up. This Wednesday will be the last of our book and Bible study on our Practice Resurrection book. Uh, that has been such a fun time for me. I hope those who have been gathered have, have also felt uplifted and uh, are learning a lot, as I am. Um, this Wednesday will be our last gathering, so we're going to do the final chapters. And uh, I look forward to doing that 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. And then next Sunday is the final beach worship of the season, because... It's Labor Day, finally and already. I kind of feel a little bit of both of those this year. It's been the fastest, longest year ever. Um, but it is, we're coming to a close, so if you have not had a chance to get out for beach worship, make it next Sunday. Um, then, September 12th, Sunday following, is when we're going to worship as one congregation at what time? 10 o'clock, not 8.30, not 11, but 10. We'll gather at 10 o'clock. Um, and after worship, we'll have our congregational meeting when we will elect officers and our pastor nominating committee. Um, you'll see more details about this in your newsletter. Um, we'll also have a meet and greet time of fellowship in uh, the fellowship hall. Uh, we'll gather because it's been a while since we gathered as one congregation, um, but also get a chance to meet some of our newer members, those who came to be officially part of our congregation while we were scattered over the last 18, 20 months. Um, so we will have a, a full Sunday on the 12th, so make plans to be here. Um, thinking about the fellowship hall, the, after we finish today, if you have a sweet spot for sweet potatoes, it is your lucky day. There was an abundance of sweet potatoes at the Lord's Food Pantry, and they weren't able to give them all away. And so there's a box on a cart under the portico near the fellowship hall, and you are welcome. Those potatoes need a good home. You can either take a whole bag, or if, like me, you really only need a couple, you can rip open a bag, take what you need, but then set the bag aside so people don't pick up a tumbly bag. Um, but after worship, please uh, help to give those taters a home. All right, last announcement. Our first hymn this morning is actually going to be three hymns this morning. And if you look, you see there are no hymns listed. It's an all play. Uh, when we get to that point in the service, I'm going to ask y'all to wave if you want to make a request. So if you're not sure where to find your favorite, favorite hymn of all time, here's a hint. Page 1009 is where the index, index of common titles and first lines resides. So if you know the first line of that favorite, favorite hymn, you can go find it. You have until the first hymn to do so. Don't get too distracted, though, because God longs for your heart to be connected to one another, to God, through the Spirit. So take a deep breath. I know, even through that mask, we can breathe in the Spirit. 
and be aware of God's presence as we are called to worship. of schedules and agendas to bask, to bask in, in the work of God in creation, in, in love, and in laughter. We are called to come to worship. Let, Let us answer, answer that call, sure of the likeness of God's, God's grace. grace. Thank you. 
God of all glory and grace, of dancing trinity, we see around us the proof of your creativity and whimsy. And the way children sometimes say the most accurate, embarrassing things. You build within our minds a fascination for solving riddles and working puzzles. Though most of us give that up as we are taught to grow up. Lord, life is complicated. It is full of ups and downs, and we do not always respond in ways that honor you or reflect the teachings of Jesus. Friends, sin is a serious business. It puts distance between us and the boundless love that we long to experience and that God longs to shower over us. Thanks be to God, our joy is as boundless as God's when we remember this very, very good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We are set free and invited to dance with abandon in the fields of God's grace. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. <laughs> Glory be to the Father and to the to the gospel that John wrote for us, looking at chapter 15, the first 11 verses. Listen for the word of God. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. 
My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. whole lot of stuff going on in that particular piece of John's gospel. And in fact, it's part of a larger segment of Jesus' teaching that is called his farewell discourse. In that longer discourse, we get a whole series of I am statements that layer on top of one another, helping us to see that our relationship to Jesus is like his relationship to God. That we are beloved, we are chosen, and we are sent. That we have a role to play, and that God will provide what we need to go and fulfill that role. Now, as we learned through in our study of Ephesians this summer, um, the apostle told us to stand firm. Right? We're meant to stand firm, um, that we are the church when we are God's 
active and tangible presence in the world. We talked about praying, and all of that is important. All of those things are actually a big deal, and they require us to lean into God's help. They require us to abide, to be in God's presence. They also give us an, experience, an opportunity to experience so much, the richness of friendships, the beauty of God's glorious creation, the freedom of being vulnerable and honest with people who will speak love and grace and hope over that openness, that vulnerability, witnessing hearts and minds being transformed as they open up to God's grace, we get to experience deep, deep gratitude that flows out of the truth that we are indeed fiercely, deeply, and eternally loved. Just because we are. Not because of anything we do or anything we say and not because of anything we avoid doing or saying, but because we are. We are are loved. So in case you wondered if the apostle who wrote that letter strayed too far, here's Jesus saying that the key practice for his disciples, his followers, is to abide, to remain in right relationship, to stay open to God's presence, to make ourselves at home in God's heart. This requires us to be as connected to Jesus as a branch is to its vine, which requires us to know who we are and who we are to God. Because when we are connected that way, we can truly live into who we are, growing, leafing out, and even bearing fruit. And if you've ever been around someone who gardens, or at least putters around in a garden, you know that a happy plant makes for a happy gardener. Fruity disciples make for a happy Jesus. He told us so. I have said these things that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. Jesus wants us to experience life in his presence, crafted into his vine, hanging out in his sheepfold, eating at his table. You pick an image. Whichever one helps you to be in his presence, hold on to it. Because hear this, my friends. Jesus wants us to experience joy. And that our joy would be complete. In his farewell discourse, this is wrapping up his time here on this earth. Jesus is closing, talking to his closest people, like his people. And he's telling them about joy. He knows there will be grief, confusion, betrayal, all of it. And he warns them about it. But he also says... I want you to know how to know joy. Now, I don't know about you, but there's been an awful lot of my church life that was far from joyous. I promise not to name names. But in my half century or so walking this earth, I've known more than a fair few churchy folk whose joy was far from complete. Or at least joy was never part of what they added to their Sunday morning best ensemble. To be fair, we American Christians in particular can trace our lineage back to some pretty dour people. The Puritans were not known as playful. And we Presbyterians, we can point back to Jean Calvin, also not known for dad jokes or witty banter. We actually arm wrestle with the Lutherans and Episcopals regularly for ownership of the nickname Frozen Chosen. But here's the thing. 
When we say that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we don't mean that God is stagnant or boring. We're saying that God is dynamic enough to remain constant in an ever-changing world. We're saying that God's word is living and thus relevant across generations and cultures. We're saying that God's spirit is fluent and speaks clearly to and through every, every human whose heart and mind are open and who is abiding in Christ. And that, my friends, is what our life in Christ is all about, experiencing the fullness of the connection between the human and the divine in worship and in our every, every, everyday lives. When we abide in the love of Christ, when we walk in the way of Christ, when we are connected to the heart of God through the Spirit, when we live worthy of the calling to which we have been called, we bear fruit. What fruit, you ask? Take a look in Galatians. You get a whole big list. The menu of fruit includes love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and (laughs) self-control. I don't know that I've ever gotten to that part of the menu. Uh, Those first two, though. Love, then joy. Love, then joy. Listen one more time to those words that Jesus said at the end of our passage. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, what were those commandments? The first and greatest is to love the Lord your God with your whole self, heart, soul, mind, strength, all of it, right? That's the first and greatest. And the second is like it. Love your, as you love. Right. Love, 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 love. Then joy. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Love, then joy. Loving God, loving others, loving ourselves, they are the keys to abiding in Christ, who is the vine to our branches. As we abide in love, our gardener rejoices, and that joy abounds in us. I'm not sure I'm seeing it. I'm going to blame it on the masks. Smile with your eyes. What's that called? In selfies, you smize. You smile with your eyes, right? Here's what I want you to think about. Another image that Jesus gives us. He told his disciples that they should have faith like children. And do you know how children learn best? Playing. We play peekaboo with babies long enough and they learn object permanence even as they learn to laugh. We play pick up the object tossed from the high chair long enough and they learn grown-ups don't like messes even as they giggle uncontrollably at our eye rolls. They play house and tea parties and that's how they learn social skills. Toddler conversations with beloved stuffed animals prepare them for choosing and becoming adolescent confidants. The thing is, we don't name it, but children learn what love looks like when they find people they can play make-believe with. It is a joy to behold kiddos creating worlds where baby Yoda can happily exist with fairies and Batman and Paw Patrol buddies. Stories grow more and more fascinating when you overhear them and they're taking turns saying, and then, ooh, ooh, and then guess what they do next? That kind of play looks an awful lot like love. Staying with a friend and really listening, noticing what the other is saying and doing. 
Being the kind of person that adds to the story instead of bringing it to a screeching halt or making it too hard to understand. Being a good friend, loving their little neighbor, means sharing ideas and toys freely and being there to help without taking over, even when things don't go exactly the way you want. You know, those are good rules for grown-ups, too. We don't play make-believe often. Improv comes close. It is truly a wonder and a joy to see skilled performers take the stage or on recorded sketch shows like Saturday Night Live. Those sketches, those are grown-up make-believe with props instead of toys, acting out the stories as they make them up. But you know, we don't even have to do improv to be part of a story that we make up as we go along. Sounds an awful lot like life. We inhabit our own stories. You, me, each and every one of us. And our stories, they intersect all the time. Right now. Even as we have gathered here, all of our stories have intersected in this place that we call Shalot Presbyterian Church. Even in a pandemic world, as we create our own stories, we are writing a story as God's people together, the church, every time we gather. It's not make-believe. It's life. And it is a lot like improv, taking the prompts and the props that we've been handed and moving the narrative ahead together, each taking a turn in the lead and it can look an awful lot like love if we do it right, when we build one another up as we go. I can't help but think it has to be a joy and a wonder for God to behold us in those moments when we do love one another well, listening rather than talking at or talking over each other. When, when we make sure that other people know that we really, really do have their backs so that they can be open and vulnerable. Because being part of any community, even one built on faith, hope, and love, requires risk, courage, great courage, of any member to truly be open and honest about where they are and what they need. It must be an absolute joy for God to see us laughing with instead of laughing at each other. Making sure that everyone gets a chance to shine. And it must bring Jesus great joy to see his followers bringing their whole selves to the worship space, opening their hearts to the moves of the Spirit with childlike wonder instead of a critical spirit. Remember, Jesus said these things to us so that his joy might be in us, in each and all of us. Jesus has placed God's great capacity for joy in us through his words, through his life, through his love for us. And Jesus is overjoyed when we say yes to that love. And all the more when we begin to spread that love around everywhere our stories intersect with family and friends and neighbors and strangers. That is when our joy is made full. Shall we play? Shall we pray? God most high, God with us. 
we praise you with every word we speak and with every moment we fall silent. You hear all of our prayers and you sustain us along with all living things. You forgive our sins and bring us close so that we might live in the goodness of your holy presence. We pray with thanksgiving for your awesome deeds of salvation for us and to all the farthest edges of the earth. With the strength that raised mountains, would you calm the roaring seas of conflict? Calm the waves of violence and oppression. Draw all nations and peoples close to each other and to you. We pray for everyone who longs for your joy. For those who are sick or in pain from morning to night. For those whose grief weighs them down. For those who hunger and thirst for guidance righteousness, or food. For those who fear for their safety as storms come for them. Very real storms like Ida and those storms of our own making and those internal storms when we feel out of control of our very selves. Rain down your love once again, O oh God, and soften our hearts so that our lives can bear your fruit. Crown our lives with your goodness and let everything we do overflow with blessings for your people. Make us curious again, open to the delights of learning, seeing with fresh eyes the people around us and the wonders of your creation. And may that curiosity breed generosity, which grows into the kind of love that brings you joy, so that our joy might also be made full. We pray in the name of our joy, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will be using a responsive affirmation of faith this morning and invite you to stand as you are able in body or in spirit and join me in saying what we believe. We believe in God, our parent, the creator, singing the spirit over the chaos of creation God made all that is beautiful and good and precious, giving songs to the prophets and melodies to the people. God saved them from flood and fire and famine. Hearing the cries of those in exile and oppression, God came in flesh and comes in our flesh today. We believe in Jesus, our Savior, the Christ, Cooing into silent nights, Jesus entered the world amongst the lowly. Chanting songs of freedom, Jesus proclaimed good news to the captive. Wailing and weeping, Jesus understood the stress and sorrow of a broken world. Frolicking around wells and streams, Jesus opened hearts to living water. Dancing through death, Jesus invites us to proclaim life in death's bitter sting. We believe in the Holy Spirit, our power, the comforter, breathing delight and joy into God's people. The Spirit flows through David's poetry and Solomon's wisdom, giving insight to those who long to see. 
the Spirit revealed Jesus to Anna, Simeon, and Nicodemus. Gathering the many and blessing them with gifts, the Spirit creates and recreates the body of Christ. With believers in every time and place, we affirm that the Creator, Savior, and Spirit are active in us, for us, and through us, now and always. Amen. See, I thought I was going to find one of my favorites to read as the benediction, but it's not the right one. I hate when that happens. But we will go out with joy. We'll be led forth with peace, and the mountains and the trees will shout forth before them or something like that. But here's what I will say. You, 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 every one of you, and all of us together are so deeply loved. So deeply loved. And there is someone that you're going to run into today that needs to hear that. So be the person who is kind enough and joy-filled enough to bring joy to that person's heart. Tricky part is you don't know who they are, so you might as well just do it for everybody. So go in the power of the Holy Spirit to love and serve your God and just spread love to everyone you meet. Amen. <laughs>